I have been reading Moby Dick Friday nights at the Sober Bar. I like to read the classics from time to time because I figure, well, they are classics, right? This book is easily 500 pages long. There are some really, really good parts. Scattered through massive quantity is really boring parts. <laughs> I'm talking mind-numbing, drool-inducing, really boring. So I sincerely apologize if any of this describes my speaking skills as well. But take heart, Matt will be back next week, okay? We're going to finish up the book of Philemon this morning, so I'd like to read to you. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the aged and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending me my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything, so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has, any, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. A little background would be helpful right here. If you're to walk into a library today, and I admit it's been a long time since I walked into a library, okay, or go online or purchase a book or something that has to do with slavery, more than likely, it will focus on slavery in our country during the 16th and 17th century. But if you dig deeper, you will find that slavery still exists today and has been around for a very long time in all cultures. I mentioned last week that some scholars think that one-third of the residents of Rome were slaves. Wow, when we think of slavery, we think specifically about a specific race as being slaves, but in the world in the time of Paul, that was not the way so it was. Slaves blended in racially with the general population. No doubt being a slave was not a good thing. Um, they were property. They could be bought and sold, or if an owner died, it, they were considered part of the estate. And they were also... He could, they could be paid off if he had a debt that he could not pay. They would give him the slaves. They could be beaten and killed simply because they were not considered people. Being a slave there, you know, didn't necessarily mean working in the fields at that particular time. Many were given the task of running the household. If you go back to the Old Testament, remember Joseph? He was a slave, right, to Potiphar? They kept the books. They, some of them were teachers. And some of them were even physicians. Um, I understand there were some extremely influential in politics and business as well. Michael Carter suggested that Luke, the physician, was actually a slave. Don't know if that's true or not. One article I read 
said that at one time the Roman legislature toyed with the idea of making the slaves identify as such, but they dropped the idea because they didn't want the slaves to realize there were so many of them and then decide to revolt. It's a lot. There were laws and the people to enforce them against slaves who ran away, much the same as they were before and during our Civil War. Onesimus was one slave that did decide to take off. We don't know exactly why he did it. Possibly he had stolen from Philemon, or maybe messed up in his duties and was worried about being reprimanded. He did what many did at the time. He went to a place where he could blend in with the crowd and start over in life. But that new start would include constantly looking over his shoulder to see if somebody was on to him. Somehow, and I love it when God does this, he came across Paul. We can only speculate how it happened. Was it a coincidence? I don't like that word. A chance meeting or was it intentional? We don't know. What we do know is that it fit into God's plan. We know from what Paul said last week that Philemon was a good man. So it was doubtful that he had abused Onesimus. Maybe the runaway slave had second thoughts and had heard that Paul was nearby. He may have known Paul by name because Philemon may have talked about him. Perhaps it was Tychicus, remember from last week. Um, He was from Colossae and probably knew Philemon and maybe Onesimus as well. Not only did Onesimus meet Paul, but they became very close. I'm certain that it started slowly, and there were probably some hiccups along the way. But Paul describes in verses 11 and 12 as someone who formerly was useless to you, and my very heart. I have no doubt that the conversion of the former slave experience was indeed genuine. Paul would not have been impressed by flattery and deception. He uses the same phrase about the heart when he speaks about Timothy and other places in the Bible. Now, we don't know how long he was with Paul during his imprisonment. When you think about it, God's got a wonderful, wonderful sense of humor. Paul is in prison. He is held there by the same government that would prosecute Onesimus if they could catch him. So think about it. Paul is harboring a a runaway slave, which is a crime, while he's in prison. Takes a minute to wrap your head around that, doesn't it? Paul decides the best thing to do is to send the slave home. Can you imagine the conversations they had about this? If the physician Luke mentioned in the last few verses of this letter was indeed a slave, he may may have well had input as two. There would be uncertainty and trepidation on the slave's part, not knowing what kind of reception he would receive. There would also have been some uncertainty with Paul, not knowing for sure if Philemon would honor his request. Think about it. There's nothing worse than giving somebody advice, and when they take it, it goes really badly. Paul does the prudent thing by sending Onesimus back with Tychicus. We read that in Colossians. Onesimus would not have been captured by bounty hunters if he was traveling with someone else that was close to Philemon and his family. So I want you to do me a favor this morning and picture how this meeting could have taken place. And this is all speculation, right? Was Philemon alone when the runaway walked into his home? Was his family there with him? Were there church people there at that particular point? What about people from the community that had been giving Philemon advice on how to handle that runaway slave if he ever saw him again? We don't know. But think about what Philemon was thinking. Think about what was going through his head when his runaway slave walks up to him on his own. He hands him a letter. Philemon slowly opens the letter and sees immediately it's from from Paul, his dear friend. Quietly, he starts reading the letter 
the one that we just read. Wow. It was probably very awkward for a while. Have you ever been in those situations when really nobody really knows what, what to do or what to say? I think we all have. I've actually caused some of those situations before in life. Right? After he reads the first part and talks about how much joy and comfort he has in Philemon's love, he starts verse 8 with the word, therefore. A pastor we knew used to say that that is what the preceding verses are there for. He states that he has enough confidence in Christ to order Philemon to do what is proper, but prefers to do it for love's sake. Did you catch that? He could have ordered Philemon to forgive the slave and then send him back to him. And what would have happened then? There would have been this kind of a surfy reconciliation thing going on, maybe a big going away party for Onesimus, and then when he's out the door, Philemon can breathe a sigh of relief, go, boy, I'm glad that's over with. But that's not the way that God wanted it. He has so much more in store here. Just like Philemon so long ago, God wants us to do what is proper, but he wants us to do it in love. That means getting to the real heart of the matter. It means really forgiving and not just tolerating. It means embracing the heart of the repentant person that has wronged us. It means loving with an agape love. That's a term that we throw around, but you know, it's much easier to talk about it than it is to actually do it in our life. You know, he's not even formally asked about returning Onesimus yet. Next, Paul refers to himself as aged and a prisoner of Christ. I really like this because the term aged here can not only mean older, because we don't think Paul was that old at this particular time, but it also means ambassador. There's only one letter difference between the two words in the Greek language. I had to bring the Greek up, Noel. <laughs> and they actually use those words interchangeably. It really makes sense when you think about it. Would you want an ambassador to a foreign country to be somebody without experience? Would you want him to be 18 years old and thinking that he knows everything and doesn't know a whole lot? No. A pastor we used to have called it, they have to have whiskers. And it doesn't necessarily mean facial hair. It means going through life and getting beat up from time to time and actually figuring things out. When you think about it, only God, only God can make a prisoner into an ambassador. And that's what Paul was. Paul comes out and he states that he wished he could keep Onesimus with him on Philemon's behalf so that he could minister to Paul. Now when you think about it, Philemon could not go minister to Paul because of his present duties in the local church. From what we read about him last week, Philemon sounds like the kind of guy that would have been right there in the prison with Paul doing what he could for him, but he couldn't do it. He, had, he could not be in two places at the same time. So, since Onesimus was his slave, he could have sent him in his place. But you know what? Onesimus ran away. But God already knew that, and he worked it out in an unusual way. Paul reiterates that he doesn't want to push Philemon into making a decision. He wants that decision to come from his heart. A heart that we have already seen is committed to honoring and serving the God of everything. Isn't it sometimes more difficult to pray that God would move people's hearts rather than trying to maneuver them into doing what we think they ought to do to be right? He is bold when he states that there will be a difference now. In verse 15, Paul says that perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back together forever. I'm not sure if he's referring to having Onesimus back in the household from then on, 
Maybe he was talking about actually having Onesimus involved in the ministry with the church. We don't know. Or maybe he was just glancing toward heaven, its never-ending joy. In verse 16, Paul says that Onesimus would no longer be a slave, but much more than a slave. He would be a beloved brother to Paul. At the same time, he was a beloved brother to Philemon. He would be a child of God with all of the benefits of that relationship as well. That relationship, our relationship with God, is never one-dimensional. The more you reach up, the more it shows on the horizontal as well. It reaches out and it expands as our faith and obedience grows. The people around us see it, those that are close to us and those that we work with, those we come in contact with. Paul goes a step further. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. This sentence puts the crucifixion and the resurrection into perspective, does it not? Jesus did what he did because of his love for us. He took my sins and charged them to his account. Wow. So what did we learn today? This is a personal letter between two real men. And it had elements. We could have gone a lot of different ways this morning. It has the elements of the prodigal son found in Luke 15 where he came back home. It has elements of the man that was forgiven of his debt in Matthew 18. And it has a lot to do with the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I would urge you this week to start studying that, to see what that's talking about, to see what that means. It's incredibly important. There's things we don't know. We don't know if Philemon freed Onesimus or he sent him back to Paul. What? We don't know. The other thing is we don't know what effect that had on the family and the congregation. Think about this. We talked last week about uh, they believe that a large percentage of the early churches were slaves. What did those slaves think when they found out that Onesimus was back and, and forgiven? I would imagine, being around a long time, that some of them really rejoiced over that fact, and others were probably envious of Onesimus. What about the local community? That had to create quite a stir, didn't it? I mean, here this slave comes back and he forgives him instead of punishing him? The other thing we don't know is if Paul was able to use that spare room. We don't know. But there's things we do know. We do know that God is now, has always been, and always will be in full control. Whether it's a small thing, like choosing to go listen to an imprisoned ex-Pharisee, okay, or whether it's making that long trip back to somewhere that holds angst and fear for us, we can trust the one who put the, all the worlds in place to give each one of us and gave each one of us our distinct gifts and abilities. We can trust God. We do know that Onesimus became free on the day that he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. If there's anyone in this room today that has no assurance of that freedom, I beg of you to talk to somebody about it before you go. We also know, we do know that Paul is blessed both by Philemon, the master, and Onesimus, the slave, and that he was a blessing to them as well. May we be that same blessing to those around us. Now, this is a personal letter. And from what I understand, when you read it in the Greek, it's much like a letter we would send. Although I guess you have to, up, you have to update that a little and substitute email, text messages, or whatever's trendy now. I don't, I don't tweet. <laughs> I'm kind of a low-tech guy in a high-tech world, right? 
So Paul uses a, pl a lot of play on words in this letter. Letters to the churches didn't have this level of being familiar. There's another indication of how close he was to Philemon. In those days, slaves were usually named in one of two ways. Sometimes they would be given a variant of their master's names. That was fairly commonly done. Um, from what I read, it was much more common to give them a nickname. Now, this nickname is different. I, I used the illustration in the first service. I have a friend of mine. His name is Dick, okay? Dick is a common name. It's a very common name. And so when he goes into like to a fast food place or something and orders food, because Dick is so common, he doesn't like that, so he tells him his name is Vladimir. So, <laughs> what? Vladimir. Yeah, so they, so they do that. See, I'm the opposite, because my name is Byron, and it gets to be Brandon or Brian or a hundred different ways, so I nickname myself, much to the chagrin of my family, I'm Skip. Okay? So, so when I go in, it's much easier. So when they say, and what in the name, I just say Skip, and they almost always get it right. They have messed it up once, okay? So as he's telling me this story, because I was just getting to know him at the time, as he's telling me this story, his wife rolled her eyes and she says, sometimes when, she tells, when he tells him his name is Vladimir, and they'll be at their front hollering, Vladimir, Vladimir, and he forgets that that's what he told them. <laughs> and I'm thinking, lady, he didn't forget nothing. He's just messing with your head. That's all he's doing. It's different with here, though. When they gave him a nickname, it was something that actually described them. Onesimus means useful. I would think, it was, from what I read, it's very, very common for a, for a nickname for a slave. So you can imagine if you were a room with a bunch of other slaves and they said, well, Onesimus raised his hand, probably half of them would. I don't know. But in, this is where the play in words comes on. In verse 11, Paul states that he was previously useless to him, but now he is indeed useful. Onesimus, his name. And in verse 13, he states that he wishes Onesimus could stay with him to minister on Philemon's behalf. So if you kind of put all the pieces together with just a little tongue-in-cheek here, he's actually stating that Philemon would be then useful to him as well. So, just kind of a little play on words. It kind of makes you smile, doesn't it? So much of what we've talked about today centers on freedom. I don't think it's an accident that we're talking about this on our July 4th holiday. And while a big portion of our holiday centers on our freedom from England, much of it involves in our freedom as a nation and a culture and as individuals. John Adams said it best when he stated, our Constitution is made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to, for the government of any other. While it may be unpopular or out of fashion to some, I for one am thankful to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for this nation. And I will tell you, I pray for its preservation, its healing, and to return to honoring the God who is worthy of all of our obedience and our love. True freedom is in Christ. Onesimus found it. We can find it. And when it goes back to the ministry of reconciliation, that's talking to everyone we know about that freedom. As we leave and go back to our weekly responsibilities, I would end with Paul's last words in this letter. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Thank you.